Hi, and welcome to another episode of Notify Talks. Today, we are on an online format. We are meeting with Wissam Alassali. He is an assistant professor of the IE University in Segovia, and he holds a PhD in vernacular building crafts and construction technology from the University of Cambridge. A part of that, he's also uh, the co-founder of two other initiatives that he will introduce to us. And in his own words, he is a maker. He is a builder of environments and experiences and blends the art of design and vernacular building technique. This was a fascinating conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Let's go. Hi, my name is Wissam Lasseli. I'm a researcher and architect in vernacular architecture and building technology. This is my Nordify talk. Hi, Wassam. Welcome to Nordify. Um, you have such a rich and interesting professional trajectory that before uh, we actually dive into the details of your professional career, it would be very interesting to know a little bit more about uh, you and your background. Okay. Well, first, thank you so much, Tiago, for this invitation. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really great to have this conversation with you. I have to say to the audience that we know each other in completely different contexts probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago when I was in Copenhagen based there in practice. And it's amazing to see how like we took different ventures and we are here we are again talking about um, int very interesting topics. Um, let's see, I am an architect um, and a researcher. Um, I am um, assistant professor at IE University uh, where I teach architecture, design and construction. And I am a co-founder of two initiatives. Uh, one is CERCA, which is a school for building crafts. And the other one is IW Lab, which is a practice, if my practice, my architecture practice, that it's split between Damascus and Spain and, and Segovia, where I am based now. And we, 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 we can talk about that um, in a bit. Um, I worked um, as a professional, I worked in practice as an architect in Syria, in Denmark. Um, and I did research and also did some practice in the UK, in Cambridge. Um, and now I am based in Spain, where I do both. I continue uh, doing doing both of these. Yeah, so that's uh, that's true. We actually met uh, back in the days in uh, here in Copenhagen. Um, and I will elaborate a little further down the conversation why I thought it was so crucial to catch catch up with you again because I got fascinated by some of your work um, but before um, we go there maybe maybe you could elaborate a little more on your uh, on your professional work so it's clear that you have multiple initiatives going on but can you talk a, a little bit about uh, your um, your professional career where are you uh, perhaps what are you working with a little bit more in concrete mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so let me start a little bit earlier. I studied architecture in Damascus. I'm Syrian uh, and uh, I grew up between Damascus and Saudi Arabia, which actually has a little bit of an influence of how I think about architecture and design today. Um, so I studied architecture in the University of Damascus. I founded my office there uh, with Iaz, my partner in IW Lab, um, and we worked there for several years. Uh, before I had to move to um, Denmark, and I say I had is because I had, I had to move to Denmark, uh, which has been also a great opportunity to work in uh, companies that works in in the field of architecture. Um, but I've always um, had this urge to academia in a way, and so after five years of working in Copenhagen, I decided to go back to to study to school. And I did master's and PhD at the University of Cambridge. Uh, there, for me, was the prompt to work with um, local building techniques, uh, specifically tailored for a scenario of post-war reconstruction in Syria. But that, of course, kind of uh, 
diversified into many other questions um, because there has been many uh, catastrophes and wars that there has been lots of experiences that we can learn from. So I started to focus on Spanish local technique post civil war in Spain, uh, the work that has been done in Cuba and the dawn of the revolution and so on and so forth. Always interested in architecture and construction. And what was really the kind of vignette of um, this architecture and construction scope was um, the notion of scarcity and abundance. Like, how do we think of uh, resources, right? Um, and maybe kind of a, uh, not think, but rethink uh, uh, these two notions in architecture. So I, I am still fascinated and I think I still want to work on um, these kind of topics, how local building techniques can co-op with uh, first the development of design and technology and uh, second with the notion of uh, finding scarcities or uh, or fighting scarcities or finding abundance in things that we usually don't don't look at. Uh, basically, that goes into um, let me see. Um, it it covers areas where design is not the you know like the, the 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 regular notion that we think of, where a designer make a building, then it goes to permits, then it's construction. So here I'm talking about uh, maybe self construction. Uh, or uh, vernacular architecture, which can be seen both in the global south, but also in areas like you know Spain and and Europe as well. Yeah, I mean that's um, that's we're gonna we're gonna keep on 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 touching upon uh, upon that part because of course I'm also Southern European and I have this passion for vernacular architecture, so I'm also fascinated by the the work you have been um, developing. And because you have uh, a broad spectrum of competences that uh, span from the creative side to the to the building side, I would like perhaps to uh, to ask you: How do you see yourself? Are you uh, do you see yourself as a designer? Do you see yourself as a as a builder, or rather a, a teacher, a yeah. practitioner? How how do you where, where, where do you put yourself? Do you put, or it's of course obviously a mix of everything, but if you, if you, where, where is the strongest uh, with some uh, angle? Okay, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a really hard question. And um, I'm, I'm always faced with this question. And I, I would like to think about the work that we do um, maybe as a mix, but you know, it's maybe if I can find the fourth category that it's not a mix, but rather something that integrates all of these in one. I would prefer to choose that. And I was, I've been thinking about this um, lately, and I think it's maybe about, I mean, uh, I would like to say I'm a maker. Uh, and making is is super important in, in, in all aspects of, of the things that I do in my research at IE University, in my work at IW Lab, in teaching construction techniques in CERCA, in all of these, I think I centralize making as the main inquiry uh, that that really interests me. And making is fantastic because um, you can you can uh, you can co-make something with someone who really knows about what he's doing. Um, you can co-make I don't know like a timber ceiling with a carpenter, and then you're a, you're a learner, right? Um, and and. And you can invite people to make things with you, and then you then then you you're teaching them. Then you are an educator, um, uh, and and you can look at someone who's at in the making doing making something, and you can you can be a researcher. I don't know, tapping on ethnography, or you can take the pieces that they're making and think about it, and you you can become more interested in the fabrication. So I think making from at least for me, um, it kind of interweave all these. Um, you know, like learning and teaching and researching and practicing at the same time. So I would like to think that uh, the work I do is really interested and has like this endless curiosity to to making in general. Well, that was that was uh, actually a great a great way to put it. Uh, obviously, um, a maker, um, maybe a. And it's obvious, it's it's clear that it's not just maybe a maker of spaces. You see it as perhaps a broader in, uh, understanding of 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 environments. Um, but um, I'm going to stress a little bit more on the same point almost. So, so 
where's your passion burning harder? Uh, if you could, uh, if you could choose, let's say that there's no financial uh, restrictions, there's no perhaps family attachments. Uh, so if you could choose, uh, what is that you really uh, enjoy doing? I guess, I guess I know the answer already by now, but uh, <laughs> I have to put up the question. No, no, no. I, th I think that's a fantastic point. I mean, the 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 no restriction scenario is 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 fantastic. I don't I don't know. Maybe I'd have a um, a trailer where where you where I would having I don't know like all the tools from a small robotic arm to small CNC to to also I mean jigs and tools and just roam around and and, and look at um, and look at at people and cultures of making and interact with them, learn from them. Um, I think that would be what I would love doing if if um, if that's a possible scenario. And maybe I'll do it someday, who knows? Um, I think, but but if you if you want me to phrase this in a more kind of a um, theoretical kind of framework, maybe I would say that um, for me, my passion is about uh, giving a practical and theoretical critique of how architecture today think of resources. Um, so, so I really want to stress that um, uh, th that notion. So if I am to rethink um, uh, resources, I mean jumping behind this lineal approach of extraction using transport and et cetera, um, and integrate other ways uh, of, of understanding um, how resources work and how we translate resources into architecture. Now, how, what are the other alternative resources that I'm interested in and I am very passionate about? Well, basically what non-architectural agents uh, work with resources. I think we can learn a lot from them and we can integrate the way they work with the way that we design and we can work with them. So there are multiple, there are multiple kind of levels in which we can interact with non-architectural kind of agents. Some of them, they call it indigenous, vernacular, local making of buildings, but I, I kind of try to avoid limiting it to, to, those, to those, although I work a lot on in, 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 these, in these contexts, I, I think there's a lot more than that. Um, um, because if we say, uh, if we choose only indigenous, for example, we're kind of, oh, it, it's very important, but I think it kind of uh, try to give an acute other extreme of modernist architecture or modernist thinking of architecture. And what we do by doing that, by this over contrasting, is that we lose these many grades that are in between and I'm interested in. Because not every space is still has its indigenous practices. There has been many hybrid ways of making. So to re kind of cap, I think um, re again, I'm interested in a practical and theoretical critique of how we use resources. And that includes, but it's not confined to indigenous vernacular and local architecture. Yeah, so 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 let's uh, let's pick up on the indigenous vernacular uh, point uh, because our conversation will revolve quite a lot around uh, the intersection of design and technology. Um, but I'm I'm also interested in understanding, you know, you have this this passion for uh, for uh, for the indigenous uh, or the vernacular uh, architecture. Uh, you talk a little bit about your your background. Um, I'm interested in understanding a little bit when this convergence or in this intersection of technology and vernacular comes together to to shape what you're doing uh, today. Mm. Let's see. I okay. So let's let's think about let's let let's dismantle or let's let's kind of delve into some of the concepts that you have. First, I mean, um, it, it, I think we should really get it clear that technology is not born today, you know, like with these tools of new fabrication. New fabrication technologies are available, but technology has always been part of how we build, like for ages and for centuries, right? It's the techne part that, that it's, that it's, it's the techne part that it's, uh, it's about knowing how to, or the art of applying knowledge into material into materials right and material work yeah. so 
so I mean, the, 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 the way with which a carpenter is doing a joinery and the tools that he uses and the tactics that he uses are also for me like it's, 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 it's the technology of construction, right? Um, but I think like knowing that, I think what's the, sh the shift that it's happening now is we're going to, uh, although it seems completely the opposite and we're diversifying the products of architectural products, I think we're going to universal solutions and universal machines, right? So for the universal machines, um, fabrication technology in general and construction technology in general is heading toward this machine that does many things, right? So the diverse the diversity comes from the products or the output. It can it can make a bench, it can make a wall, it can make a column, it can make a slab. And I think this is fascinating. Uh, you know, in, in 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 a way, so this is this is kind of additive manufacturing robotic arm that makes many things for you, from a vase to a house. Okay, and although again, it seems like it's uh, it's opening endless ways of things. I think it's opening endless ways of products, right? Um, and and but 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 the process is basically the same. Scale is different, speed, materials, but it's just the same. Um, the other thing is the universality of solution. And I think here um, we have to be aware, or at least for me, I have to be aware from it's saying that the construction technology will be one or two things, right? And 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 I think that has ne that have never been the case. That have never been the case. And it's it's uh, I know sometimes it's useful because it kind of uh, delivers the message clearer, but I think also negating or saying no, there is a plurality in construction technologies that is very much situated to different contexts is also important to say. So we always think, you know, like additive manufacturing or uh, uh, construction for assembly or uh, fabrication for assembly technologies, they are going really fast. And I think this is fantastic. I don't think they're going to be the solution. I think they're going to be a solution of specific context, right? Um, so, so, so for me, that's where I think the margins are important. Um, and I would like to say that, yeah, again, there has been a huge plurality of ways of making. I mean, since the industrial revolution in and, and its impact in construction, and I'm interested in um, how these margins accept or reject technology, right? And how these margins try to work with it and how we can actually get the benefit from uh, approximation between the advances of technology and what seems to be the complete opposite of technology, although it's not always the case. But this, um, I, I, I agree with you, of course, um, but this fascination of this or this um, proximity you have to technology has increased um, more recently, or it's something that you have always been passionate about? Um, yeah, I think it's, um, so again, back to where I grew up, I think, <laughs> I think, uh, so I come from a, an, you know, like an area where everyone is a maker, like a shoemaker, carpenter, um, um, a pottery maker, uh, everyone is making something and you know my my extended family every uncle or every aunt they do something right the, like one is they weave they make shoes they many things and so i think um i kind of appreciate a lot the uh, human aspect of make human aspect of making you know and and what does it mean to to work with making but i was always fascinated by also like jigs and tools that those people use in their making. Um, I was always interested in like, now moving very fast forward to study and architecture. Um, I yeah, I have been very much since the beginning quite interested in uh, you know vernacular building. And of course, I, um, you know, like I had an influence uh, through studying Hassan Fathi, for example, I spent the whole kind of year trying to digest his building and think about his building. I worked also closely, although we didn't work on, you know, like what they call traditional architecture, but I worked with uh, people who worked with traditional architecture in the region. Um, 
namely Hussam Jairoudi. He's a he's a, Sir, a Syrian architect. He works in classical architecture. So it's it's also um, uh, something that I think has kind of influenced the way I look at architecture in general. Um, but then again, I think the fascination for technology started by starting to work with builders. Starting to work with builders. And that comes in my master's and PhD. And like I, I am on a site working with a with person, and then we start discussing the tools that they are using. And then these tools open a new possibility. Oh, why don't we do this thing with the tool so that it gives you a completely different geometry, for example? You know? So I think yeah, that's, that's from there. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that is actually uh, you 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 briefly mention it uh, on the course of of some of your answers, but it's clear that this interdisciplinary practice is um, is very present. And as you say, you are harvesting some of the of the knowledge um, from these professionals, and as you said, this co-creation. Mm -hmm. uh, making things together. Um, so, I mean, before before we start going into the details of some of your work, because what you do is quite is quite uh, specific, and you now just mention uh, uh, a series of, of of technologies that I want to hear. Before we go into the detail, uh, how how much do you think that the work that you do with the tools available, the technology uh, that it's at our disposal, how much do you see from from your from your standpoint, from your practice, mm -hmm. um, how much are they embedded in the in the construction industry or in the AEC industry so far? Mm. Mm. That's a great question, Tiago. Um, I still think that it's um, it's still in the exp experimental kind of sphere. Um, you know, I worked with the augmented reality, for example, for artisans. Um, augmented reality, it's moving fast. It's fantastic, I think, in many cases, um, but uh, it's still, it's still, um, it has a little bit of a way to become more like accessible to to builders, for example, to use it. But accessibility doesn't mean it's becoming cheap, you know. Like um, uh, that's one thing which I think is important. Uh, like they, th that people can buy it, you know, they don't have to spend uh, lots of money to buy it. But 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 I think accessibility is really comprehending what this tool does for you. Uh, and that's, I think, one part of the work I do. I try to make these things accessible, you know, uh, maybe on a smaller scale with specific people, but, you know, it's uh, it's one way of doing it. So I think there's it's still experimental, um, but it has lots of potential, um, specifically because I try to tap on also on using using technology but confining the work to the simple tool that you have on site and by that i mean using you know like tools to rationalize your design and maybe but this, the tools are still the same and we can talk about this later like a, a, a builder or a, a, someone who's making a vault is just have the trowel the mortar but the geometry that they're doing is much more efficient, for example, than the classic geometry, right? And maybe it needs a jig to make it, and I, we can talk about this later. Uh, so there's also this, like, how do we use this very kind of um, um, interesting tools of analysis, uh, but then the construction itself, it becomes, uh, it stays, it stays simple. So on that, I think there's, there's, there's a lots of possibility to because it's already embedded in the construction technology without having to like interfere with huge infrastructure of tools and technologies to be purchased and installed, etc. With some, uh, you you have been talking about maybe verbalizing slightly different what I consider is very important or it's be, in my opinion it's becoming again more and more important to approach uh, the practice from an interdisciplinary way, really learn from uh, other disciplines and other, and other um, perhaps creative and technological uh, uh, fronts. So maybe before we, we dive a little bit more into details of, of the, the solutions that you are crafting, maybe talk how, how do you think uh, this technology and this knowledge, all these things that you're looking at is currently integrated into the practice? Uh, are they? Are they not? Could you uh, maybe uh, phrase it a little bit? 
Sure, I have two answers to this, I think. The first one is that uh, when, on the technology part where I experiment with AR, for example, and with making tools for builders to build faster, for example, there's still it's still in an experimental kind of approach. It's going really um, steadily to, to become better and better every, every time, but I, I think there's still a way to make it accessible. And by accessibility, I don't only refer to it being like cheap for, to buy, but also to comprehend you know, through by builders um, uh, on site the, and, and construction companies and all that, like the, the, the width and breadth and of, of, of these tools and the way they can impact their work. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work there. And, I, and I, th I, I would like to think of the work that we do as part of that, you know, like part of making these kind of things more um, accessible from, from like an understanding point of view. The other answer is that I, I I think it's very integrated because I already engage with already existing building traditions and local techniques, right? So I and 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 I and I, and I try to work with these techniques. And usually those now sometimes they are not considered in the you know like um, typical architectural design and construction companies, but they still operate in many cases. Sometimes they operate in, 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 in an informal construction way. So there is no architect at all. It's just the builder doing something. Sometimes they operate in a restoration project. Sometimes it operates in even, you know, like experimental project. Uh, so they already exist and they are the construction industry. So I would like to think that it's already integrated and I'm just, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm jumping and being part of this uh, plethora of traditions and building cultures that I that I try to have a conversation with. OK, I, I like that of the, the, the building cultures, um, because one of the things that I've uh, I've been, uh, I don't know, maybe talking to myself uh, is to focus on what is design uniqueness these days. And um, as you know, uh, I, I'm Portuguese um, and um, I try to, although I've been practicing uh, around the, in Europe and I've been uh, here in, in Denmark in the past uh, uh, 16, 17 years, um, I find that, uh, um, in my opinion, globalization and internet has paved the way to create an architecture that, to some extent, doesn't belong anywhere. And um, the way I see it, um, and that's also something that I really appreciate in the work that you're doing, uh, design uniqueness came until recently. Um, it was very rooted and connected to the place. It was connected to the cultural background, to the tradition, to mm. the material resources available. Uh, mm. You talked about scarcity, but also finding the abundance, uh, local techniques. So um, to me, it's a little bit at, at times I feel sad that architecture today is losing uh, those, uh, those, those roots. And in, in my uh, Portuguese to English translation, I would say, it's kind of lacking soul. Mm -hmm. um, what is your what is your um, what is your perspective on on the state of contemporary architecture uh, today? And maybe you agree or you disagree with uh, with the way I'm seeing mm -hmm. um, things. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's it's also yet yeah, a fantastic question. I think um, uh, because it kind of ties everything that we're talking about. You know, like technology and and. It seems like we're talking about, and, and you avoided saying style, and I agree with you. You know, it's not a style. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I can say that I think that the way we have been, um, we went to school and learn. There was always kind of a movement. There was always yeah. kind of a style, mm. uh, and those styles were 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 rooted again in that circumstance, mm. uh, cultural and financial circumstance of mm. of of the area. Mm. Um, of course, they influenced perhaps each other, and 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 there was uh, travelers that brought ideas. Mm. But it's not the same as everyone today looking into an uh, architectural uh, uh, blog or aggregator and and to some extent repeating um, architecture, uh, regardless of the location. So that's I'm not sure if it's a matter of style. Rather, uh, the buildings today can be here or can be uh, uh, anywhere. That's my, my my opinion. Exactly, and it's super important that you mentioned the the travelers, for example, because that kind of pinpoints the whole thing for me. Uh, the example of the travelers. You see, um, I I think um, 
there are like vernacular architectures and S is intended, like I intend to have the S here, uh, is global. Is not, is not, it, it's rooted in the place, but as a knowledge is global. I mean, you can find touch ceilings uh, from, I don't know, um, Northern Syria and, and Holland, right? You can find um, uh, specific types of vaulting technique in Mexico and in Iran, you know? Uh, um, uh, so, so, so when it, what, what dictates this universality? Well, uh, materials and climatic kind of conditions, right? That's what that's what they're, they're quite this, they're quite the same. And you know, like um, South Turkey on the mountains, it rains a lot. Like you know, in Holland, and it's very cold. And you know, like they use thatch ceiling in both in both in both locations. Um, in Egypt, Iran, and Mexico, they kind of like they are in the same uh, uh, line when it comes to uh, altitude uh, of of the globe, and they have similar climate and materials cultures. Um, so what happens is that I think, um, and back to your back to your idea about travelers, is that we start we we uh, uh, travelers they uh, imported and exported techniques and knowledge, not materials and building components. And I think that's what's really the difference between what you're describing today as solace architecture and what is um, um, uh, the notion of being rooted in a place and a culture, right? So I think when, when we stop, when we start to realize that we need to stop importing and exporting materials, you know, like um, and specific building components, uh, repeating them exactly the same. Why don't we take the knowledge behind these building components and try to see how it can connect with the local, uh, with the local conditions? And I think that is a very useful kind of turn point towards this architecture. I have to also say that um, this is a very rationalist approach to tra to traditional architecture. I don't intend to you know like talk only about proportions and beauties of the proportions that are existing in the classic architecture and that we should stick to it uh, i don't i don't think at least the, i think that's a very valid argument but i don't think that's how i would like to define my work but rather i again i really think that it's really about the underpinnings behind why they're using touch ceiling that i'm interested in you know and and you can do attached ceiling the same way that it exists in a uh, a, a North Syrian hut, but you can also do it completely differently. Yeah. You know, like you can use it, you can use it, and you can use it mixed with different tools. So it's a ver very kind of rationalist approach to 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 what the vernacular. Because again, because vernacular architecture is very global, it's very adaptable, and we cannot freeze it into a building typology. And that's how I differ, or that's how the work that we try to do kind of differs from the uh, traditionalist approach to architecture. I, I don't want to repeat uh, the same thing if there is, I mean, if it works, great. If there is a better way of doing it, now that we understand engineering of building better, well, why not? So I think this it's kind of this adaptability that I love. And if we embrace both things, you know, like importing and exporting knowledge, but at the same time being very adaptable with what is you know, like local architecture is, I think we might be heading to a much better, environmentally better, culturally better, socially better architecture in the future. Yeah, I completely agree with you, and I love this this um, this uh, idea of stop importing, exporting materials, but uh, keep importing and exporting knowledge and and technique. We can shift the conversation a little bit more into um, the, the the technology part. Of, yeah. of your work mm -hmm. um, because I mean uh, I, we 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 lost touch perhaps for a couple of years until I suddenly saw one of your posts with this uh, absolutely amazing um, video of the construction of this vaulted pavilion um, mm -hmm. on the I guess on the courtyards of of the university in Segovia yeah. and um, and then I was, I was, I thought like, okay, this is, I need, I need to understand a little bit more what you are, what you're doing. This was very interesting. The combination of augmented reality mm. with, uh, with uh, traditional building technique. So maybe can you, can you talk us a little bit about uh, how you're using uh, technology 
to enhance the work or the research that you're that you're doing? How do you how do you see this more uh, getting more and more integrated? Absolutely, and I think the pavilion is maybe like a very good example of 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 these um, of these dynamics. Um, I mean, this pavilion has been is a part of a project that um, I'm collaborating on with um, Form Finding Lab at uh, Princeton University, um, and um, we also had had a cohort of really good. Uh, um, researchers with us from the University of Bergamo and um, um, also local local construction companies and builders. So it's 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 again it's back to your idea about interdisciplinarity. I'm an architect. I'm not an engineer. Um, I understand a little bit of it and I, I love engineer engineering in general, specifically when it comes to form finding and um, tools that kind of intuitively drives you into understanding how your design intention can be translated into physical components. But I also I work a lot with engineers um, and and we had a, a, a again a beautiful cohort of engineers that worked on this project. Um, and at the same time we had this uh, uh, we had my is actually the co-founder of Cerca, the school in which we provide training for people uh, on traditional building building techniques in Spain, specifically vaulting. We focus a lot on vaulting. Um, so I have Salvador with me, who's who's the co-founder of Circa, but he's also a colleague with whom I realized lots of work um, and many previous kind of experiments as well uh, and work. Um, so uh, for that, we worked on, um, we had this question that, um, and maybe here I'll dive in a little bit with um, the technique itself, so this this type of vaulting it doesn't use it doesn't need uh, formwork, right? Because it uses plaster of Paris and very lightweight tiles, and it's like laminated. It's really like laminated vaults, so it doesn't need that much. It needs a little bit, but not that much of formwork. What it needs, though, when it doesn't have a classic shape of a barrel vault or a crest vault, is some something to guide the builder, visually guide the builder to where these to where these styles go, right? Yeah. yeah. Usually they use um, something. I don't know if I have it here, but they use like PVC rods where they bend it and to describe the shape. Yes. We used AR, so it's kind of a virtual rods that told the builder how to use. Now it sounds like. Um, it, it actually has been like we used AR for these rods, but it came after different different kind of iterations and conversation with the builder. So I think I really want to um, emphasize on this conversation with the builder that led to the model that we provided to the builder eventually, right? Because I think there's a good question here is that how suggestive uh, or, you know, like dictating those information that we're adding on this HoloLens to the builders like is it is it actually an emancipation or is it a burden i mean i was super interested in this question is it helping or is it like not helping and was it helping it is it was <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it was it's 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 i, I think it was but it, it 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 took some time to actually realize like how much information do we give uh to to, to the builder to build this so this is this is basically like an example of the research that I do that kind of try to fuse, um, you know, like uh, building technology of today with traditional building techniques. Yeah, and that's the amazing part of it. But but um, but uh, then maybe my question needs to be. So are these tools really um, helping us just to increase the efficiencies and calculate perhaps uh, uh, very difficult uh, uh, ways to 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 put together these geometries um, i'm guessing everything that you do is pretty much double curved so um are just the two here like this convenient accessory that allows you to to deliver or this or do you see that these digital tools are actually helping us to do something that we previously couldn't uh perhaps we are actually allowing ourselves to the, to do something completely new maybe not now yet not maybe not yet now but do you see that um it will evolve that way how do you see as an accessory or or more than that it's also a 
like a, a very good question. I, honestly, I think it's too early to know. Um, it's it's too early to know. Um, and maybe again, we go back to the problem of accessibility. It's not yet, you know, like uh, very much uh, in hand, or we don't really know. Uh, it's not it's not something that we use on a daily basis. So that I think that then maybe we can start to ask if those if those are relevant or not. Um, back to the exact kind of um, um, question about, for example, the last experiment that we did, it helped in a in a specific way, and I think. Um, I mean, how how do we measure that? Well, we do conversations with the builders, with everyone who participated in this, and and, and it seemed like it's it provided a solution that could be very useful in the future when you know, like a builder, uh, like uh, use it autonomously, right? Like they're using it without without the need to have uh, all these people around them to 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 hold to, to do the sets for them. And that was a case, you know, like that the the the, uh, the the builder has been um, very interested in in the tool, and um, he's he's we're trying to purchase one for him, and um, he might he might want to use it on on his on his construction sites as well. So, but but um, again, to avoid universal kind of solutions. <laughs> I think it, it didn't work in other crafts. For example, in a specific carpentry craft that we're looking at right now, this craft relies a lot on um, templates, and those templates are easy. They're easy to fabricate. They can you can laser cut them. I mean, they don't like AR is not is not useful there yet. Yeah. I mean, there will, there will be a day when we think like yeah yeah in this specific type of craft maybe we can use it in this scenario. Uh, and that would be it. But I'm just I'm bringing this example to say that everything has a little bit of a, 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 a specific kind of conditions um, that drives the how successful or not successful each technology is. Right. Um, I, I wanted to say something, but, but you want you wanted to ask something before. But no, 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 not not necessarily. Um, I think that you mentioned something about it's perhaps too early. Mm -hmm. to um, to know what's the answer and and to that uh, extent in the, in one of the videos that I've uh, reviewed for uh, to prepare for the interview um there's this there's the, the video of all of you working on the garden and I think his name is is David uh, David Goodman I think it is the dean is, is the of dean. Uh, Yes, of the IE Architecture School, he says, um, and I have to 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 quote, uh, the future I believe will somehow somehow be in this dance between surrendering a certain amount of control to machines in certain areas, maintaining control, and then working together to do things that we couldn't separately do, machines and and people. Um, and I actually think that this is one of the things that you're perhaps also uh, emphasizing that that uh, you don't need to enforce a certain tool to a certain discipline if the tool yeah. is not really helping. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think he puts it in a very poetic, beautiful, but also right way of understanding how we um, how we how we deal with these with these tools. And I, I have a, like a little story about um, we, we should also. I mean, technology for me, at least technology is not all, always like um, a giant manufacturing plant that does millions of house per second. That's one side of technology. It's valid. It's great. But, but I don't think we can confine technology to, to these conditions. It's not this one robotic arm that it's, you know, like held on a drone and it 3D prints house forever. I, that's one part of it again, and it's a very valid part, but I don't think it's the only part. Um, jigs in crafts teach us a lot, you know, like a jig again, back to universality of, of tools. A jig is the complete opposite of universality of tool. It's something that you make to make something specific, right? It's, it's kind of a mean that you fabricate, but because you fabricate a jig, which might be just a triangle, you don't need that huge infrastructure, right? It's something simple. You can do it. It does the job for you. But it kind of leads to a metamorphosis in the way that you make things. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. I'll give you an example. Um, in Catalan modernism, builders of vaulting, they were using, again, things to describe strings 
to describe battle vaults, to describe stairs um, in, in, in Catalonia. And then came an, a, a brilliant architect called Antoni Gaudí, and he told him that if you use the same strings as jigs, but if you change the composition, you can you can start building hyperbolic uh, geometries by just you know like doing two cylinders, two circles, twisting them. You will get a doubly curved structure, right? What did he do? He just worked with jigs, but that jig kind of contributed to the amazing, unprecedented architecture of Sagrada Familia and other buildings of Gaudí. So we shouldn't underestimate in technology, these kind of small things that we use and builders use to actually influence the way with which we think about construction industry. Yeah, I mean, I guess, and then, uh, and I think that that's a good, uh, it's a good way to, to, to put it into, into my, um, my next question, because of course, Gaud, architects like Gaudi or creators like Gaudi, they were uh, to some extent innovating Mm. ahead of their time mm. and that's very uh, that's very uncommon or it's very few people that actually has that kind of foresight to understand that I'm going to be designing something that perhaps is not yet plausible to build but the, the pace of technology is accelerating and very soon you will be able to to do um, so um, I would I would perhaps ask you then uh, if you believe that in this accelerated uh, age of technology and we today we mentioned already uh, robotics uh, drones additive manufacturing uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned uh, uh, artificial intelligence until uh, until up to now but I'm going to say that now uh, there's digital twins and operations of there's so many um, technologies that are that are helping us to 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 enhance our creations mm -hmm. um that i think i'm i have to ask you uh, you being the, the architect the builder the researcher if you um if you think and of course you obviously been working so much with immersive reality um do you think that uh, a, a company a normal company um can move forward without mm -hmm. let's say a clear innovation strategy uh, mm -hmm. or at least if um, if they don't have sort of a, a research and innovation or research and development department in-house because perhaps they are uh, too small let's say mm -hmm. um, or don't have the budget to to accommodate for such um, how can you bridge um, to the researchers to maybe affiliate with companies that are pioneering developing can you uh, can you talk a little bit about how do you see this acceleration of it's to me it's kind of a maybe my question is not very clear but there's kind of a almost almost a paradox of mm -hmm. you have all this technology uh, available so you have this toolbox that it's expanding but it's expanding in such a speed that you might not even recognize uh, the screwdrivers anymore uh, at the other, uh, and on the, other, on the other hand, you might have very specialized companies. You might have uh, res might have uh, research institutes um, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, academic lines that are focusing on more kind of niche perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you perhaps talk a little bit? How do you see uh, all of this coming together? The practice and the research. I, yeah, I can. I can. I'm, I, you were talking, and I'm starting to recall like architectural practice that I think that they are. You know, like they they. Um, they, they 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 kind of ring the bell ring the bell when you when you when you were when you're talking about uh, research and innovation within practice and i think like you can have architecture offices that are specialized in something you know it's and and, and they still like do buildings but they are specialized in specific way of doing these buildings or specific way for fabrication and i think this is great i i mean if and this is really for me it's suitable for uh, architectural offices that are small you know, like that are not very big uh, because they can be the architects who do these 3D printing facade all the time, you know, like and they are like pushing the industry of 3D printing facade by having one to one kind of applications, which is what we all want. So this is one way of doing it. And I think this is a fantastic way. But there are, there are already people who are doing that. And I think this is really like it's it's great. The other thing is to. Um, um, if if architectural offices, uh, they don't want to have this one specific you know, like approach of how doing things 
again, another example, like we are the office that do everything with timber, for example, and there's lots of practice that they do this this way. Um, I think they can shift the focus to a more kind of a, let's explore what we can do. And they, again, I think there's another question in your question, is it like how, do, like to have a research, uh, to have a research and innovation kind of department in our office is somewhat, you know, like, um, like how do we fund this, you know, like this resources that we have. Um, and I think experimentation is super important. For me, if I were to do this and have an architecture office and I don't want to have a focus and I don't want to have a, like I would be focusing, I would be playing, I would be doing things through making again. So in architectural offices, traditionally they had this model workshop, right? This model workshop should be model workshop for one to one building components of their buildings. I think that's another way of doing it. Uh, the last thing is, yes, indeed, there are people who are specialized on specific topic uh, in, in, in research institutions and, and universities. And it's completely fine to reach out to them to ask for their help in a specific implementation of a specific project. And I think this is happening, like it's happening with me. I'm getting, I am collaborating with many architects uh, on, for example, uh, solutions for shells or vaulted ceilings uh, or the use of natural materials in general or experimenting with new ways of thinking of materials in general. Uh, I worked with architectural offices, offices in the Middle East, in Spain and in Europe to develop solutions uh, that are related to the things that I studied for a long time. And that's completely fine. And I think to move towards this collaboration, which I think this should happen on a larger scale and a global scale, there is this element of um, uh, um, authorship that it needs also to be shift, shifted. You know, like uh, a work is also a collaborative work that is also a piece of research that it's also whatever, whatever. Now that this this is one way that I think we can enhance. If we're talking policies here, this is one way that we can enhance this cross collaborations. You know, because. It's really easier to cast a concrete ceiling than call the guy in Segovia and talk with him about specific Baltic solutions that needed to be implemented in, I don't know, like northern Denmark, right? Um, but if we can make this channel more accessible, I think we would have a much more interesting outcome. You were mentioning a couple of points that I, I, I actually uh, like. I mean, there's the real material experimentation over there. There's, of course, the, the, the building technique. Um, you mentioned uh, the scale, working on scale one to one. Um, and that that is something that, um, so in, in one of our episodes, um, we uh, we met with Ken Clausen. Uh, he's the, the, the head of uh, digital practice at 3XN. And uh, his point was pretty much that uh, the architect is becoming this, practitioner of uh, a digital world in a digital world and and how do you how do you practice uh, in a digital world that it's still so connected to the analog world and i think that you also you really you really embodied this kind of of, of persona uh, one could say um and there's no doubt that we are more and more and more becoming designers in virtual environments uh yet I really think it's the work you're doing and the way you are approaching um, design creativity and, and, and the built environment is to me super important. And that's why I, what I think is so fascinating to see how are you uh, uh, progressing. But of course, I'm also missing some of the practices that perhaps are going so digital um, or when we're talking about environments that are purely virtual, uh, that you also miss that experimentation, like those old drivers of innovation. Um, what's your What's your thoughts about? And I know that you're perhaps taking it more from a research and maybe even an academic standpoint. Yeah. Uh, while my experience is much more from a, a, a an architectural commercial uh, practice, and especially in a country so uh, digitized as as Denmark, it's quite easy to lose track of what's going on in uh, other areas of the world. 
Um, but um, how do you th how do you see this the 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 architect or the designer, the creator, even the maker, being working more and more on virtual environments? Um, is this is this for, for you? Is this net positive, net negative? Is just the way it is? Any thoughts over there? I've always been in the in the in the in this transition between the virtual to the to the physical that I I wasn't really like kind of immersed in what the virtual can 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 work. I I know for example that there's lots of tools that um, are enhancing our way of understanding architecture. They operate on the virtual world, um, and those are super important. Um, but for me, I don't think our practice is merely it could be like one way of doing this practice but I, but i don't think it's it's uh, it's a way to generalize how architecture should be um or how architecture practice should be um it could be something that has to do with virtual i mean i don't know uh, sometimes like new professions emerge from old professions so maybe there will be a new profession that it's that it's specialized in this, this designing in the virtual world that is, uh, it, it ties, it, it has some ties with the, with the, with the re realization of, of design in the physical world, but that's not necessarily that thing. And it could have like a different scope and it has like a different impact and it has like a, uh, one thing, for example, I mean, to talk in more practically now, one thing, for example, that um, has to do with these questions. For, for me, what interests me about this is that how can we transfer knowledge in this virtual world, for example? Like if I, again, it's really about, if I am in 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 the US and the builder is in 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 I don't know Morocco, uh, can we can we can we use this virtual spaces to 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 like how do we do this virtual stages uh, to to work on a project? And there is actually a project that we we worked on a little bit using this. We used photogrammetry to three D scan a very complex cave, a project of a cave, and we used this digital model. Uh, we didn't we didn't put any it, it was not like immersive environment it was just normal kind of sh people looking at a model together but it's a virtual model where we were where we were discussing with the builder getting inside right getting inside this he's seeing it through the screen but that's still fine but going inside this 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 cave and talking about geology taking about this rock taking about and with the client and with everyone so i think if it's really about maybe okay a rephrase it's if it's really about re-enhancing the conversations that you can otherwise you can't otherwise have among this disciplinaries in the physical world for me that would be like a very interesting intersection between the two other than that i'm not really sure how i think about this yeah you touched upon a, a couple of points that i i took some notes over here that for me it's um, it's also important i mean i'm thinking more like Maybe my question is was more like from a process standpoint. It's um, mm -hmm. it's um, while is it exciting at the same time for me to think that some of the some of the practices are um, globally they are jumping into technology and are able to deliver more informed designs and mm. more creative solutions. Um, I find that fascinating, um, and uh, so the tools are. That toolbox is that as I mentioned before is growing and it's fascinating when people are actually able to to pick all those tools and deliver a, an augmented uh, design. At mm -hmm. the same time, there are also other uh, professionals or the studios that are taking a much more uh, a, a version kind of approach um, and and stay kind of one could say in a more old school. Mm. Um, so I wanted to hear where, where, uh, where, where, how do you see it? But you also now mentioned something that I took note of, note over here. Um, you, previously, you talked about uh, offices that have like a, a work, modern workshops. Um, it's obvious that, uh, or at least to me, it sounds obvious that uh, a, a studio that has already that kind of um, back and forth experimentation between the design and the sculpture that they are creating with the with the final result um they should somehow upscale it from the small model to real mm. like the, the fabrication lab mm. um and uh and then of course we also talked about uh the the, the part of innovation then you you might be having all this research or innovation you might even talk about a, de a certain department but it's also from my experience sometimes so hard to then integrate that across the teams if it's not embedded 
in the structure of the company if it's not mm. part of the the founders mm. uh, approach uh, it typically just uh, is is probably just uh, something that someone in one department has a passion but doesn't come across but to 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 go a little bit into your answer that you talked about uh, maybe this technology uh, will also allow us to to develop emerging professions based on old techniques. I find that actually quite fascinating. And obviously this new technology has all the benefits of learnings and, mm. and collaboration across, across uh, uh, regions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, we can now talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, technology is um, an abstract word because technology that might be available here in Denmark uh, is different from the technology that is available uh, in Spain, where you are, which might be very different. So the technology is the same, but we go back to what you said, is the accessibility mm -hmm. to, to the technology that uh, uh, we, are, um, we are approaching from a different standpoint. So it might be like uh, different regions have different access mm. to um, to technology, and this needs to be uh, taken also into um, into consideration. Um, so, one of the questions that I was uh, thinking of doing you, to, giving you today, was uh, in regards to there's these asymmetries. So, there are countries that have more or less um, yeah. access to technology. They might be more or less uh, digitized. Um, but uh, we also seeing at the same time that there's an asymmetry, at least until recently, um, the, the state funded research institutes or the academia was really pushing forward um, this, uh, these developments and the accessibility to the tool. Now we shift perhaps more into uh, commercial firms that are really putting lots and lots and lots of, of, of uh, technological developments uh, out in the world, but their symmetries are still are still there. Uh, do you have any 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 thoughts on how do you see this acceleration of technology, uh, perhaps bridging the gap across uh, regions, across cultures, um, perhaps boosting uh, the developing world, um, or how do you how do you how do you see it? This um, yep. kind of cultural asymmetry. I am more pessimistic on on this note. Um, I, I, th I think here we we're talking about conditions that are really in, entangled with political, social and global kind of um, um, realities. And uh, I think if we don't address technology in relation to all these, it's going to be kind of a, um, an approach that it, it lacks something, right? It lacks it lacks it lacks the 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 the, the connection between this technology and, and, and the realities of these worlds. Um, so I, I think um, the symmetry, this asymmetries, first we need to ask why do they exist, right? And, and, and I think there's, um, there's a lot to talk about here, but maybe this is not the topic. <laughs> This is a <laughs> <laughs> we could have another another uh, one hour conversation just on that. That's so true. I mean, we're we're we're, we're there is there is a post post colonial uh, realities that 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 we have across the globe that uh, it's really hard to to neglect, right? And and it's it's consequences and implications we are still living today. And you know, like uh, uh, we kind of know. Uh, we we live with that. I mean, me as a person who's coming from uh, Syria uh, in the Middle East, live with that in every day. Um, so, I don't think technology is solution to to those to those uh, uh, to to those problems. And those problems are really inherently um, um, intertwined with the built environment. I want to bring back the conversation to to our profession, right, to the built environment. No, but absolutely. like, if you think about uh, uh, urban I mean, if you think about the the physical realities there, we you have lots of um, urban urban housing inequality, informal housing, uh, urban degradation, environmental degradation, that it's pretty much intertwined with um, um, with 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 these post-colonial realities in general and the current conditions of the regimes that govern that area. Um, 
I think this gap will continue to exist. You know, like it's kind of a, but it's not our race. It's really not the race that we we want that that I want to. It's not about like you know, rich. It's kind of a completely. Um, I think it's a completely different scope that we should that we should focus on here, and hence that brings me back to the very very first questions that you ask about scarcity and abundance. You know, um, and here I will. What people think the the other location or geography is lacking is their perceptions of scarcity and abundance. Um, so what do what do these re what do regions in the global south have? Um, that's something we should start. Like that's where the technology question starts for me, right? It's not what the West has that it needs to be transported to these regions. It's what these re these region has, and they have a rich different ways of making things rich, different ways of thinking about things and resources. Um, and things that, you know, like ind indigenous technology is something that it's been taught now in different schools and universities as a way to like as an alternative to this universal environment and universal um, kind of a, um, um, global approach um, that m existed in the last uh, century. Um, and I think those are very interesting places to start the conversation about technology um, and not and not from this gap. Uh, but and not from this gap. Yeah, but but don't you think that uh, when you refer to the global south and the richness of those cultures that now, especially I'm thinking more more about artificial intelligence and the ramifications that this can have from X, from education, for example, you can have the best teachers uh, right next to you suddenly, uh, healthcare, you can have the best doctors right next to you, you can have, to me, it seems that there is the potentially the big winners could be uh, the global south, could be the developing countries because they just gonna leapfrog uh, generations, uh, if if of course they have the access to to the technology. In this particular case, I'm thinking about um, artificial intelligence because it could actually help you scrutinize uh, the adequate techniques or uh, availability or, or resources or you know best practices and so on. So uh, yeah, maybe I'm the naive uh, Western <laughs> person that uh, that uh, doesn't really understand, but. You, it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's partly true. It's uh, you live in this bubble of of uh, in the West, um, that sometimes have difficulties to to relate what's uh, what's going on in other regions. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe I'm not so pessimistic, in the sense that not not for the status quo, but actually for the opportunity in 10, 20, uh, 30 years um, that I think life for in some regions will significantly. Uh, increase life, living conditions will significantly increase. I hope, um, but I would like to ask you uh, one uh, one last question. Now that we are talking about uh, if uh, technology will or will not improve uh, the future, uh, there's um, you're also taking the the, the 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 conversation is taken from a very academic uh, uh, position. So I always like to ask our guests, how do they see the future? If they had the crystal ball and they had to, to guess the future, how does that future look like? And based on that plausible, uh, um, that, that future that uh, we are seeing coming, um, how would you uh, help uh, future professionals or even the current professionals from your standpoint? How do, what's your, your best, advice and and mindset needed to to uh, to thrive um I talk to people <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's it <laughs> <laughs> to be more yeah. with people uh, think <laughs> i i mean i think the future although I, it it like you can talk to chat gpt endlessly and mid journey to generate photos endlessly which I really think this is great, you know, um, and those are actually communities that forming communities of practice, right? There are people who are sharing this interest about this specific tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I'd really like to emphasize, I think the future is um, interdisciplinarity, 
going to be composed in this interdisciplinarity between different things because um, the products, again, they're going to be very much diversified that um, you would always need people to complement the way you think to realize things, right? Um, and maybe I think that, um, again, there is, oh, let me recap, let me recap, uh, Tiago. Um, so I was saying, talk to people, um, and I think the kind of the future of this technology is going to be very dull if it's not in conversation with humanity and humanitarian kind of approach. And this is the academic kind of uh, um, side of me saying this. And, you know, academia in general, it's slower than, you know, like companies uh, because they there is in our in architecture, it has this humanity part that it needs to reflect on what's going on. And I think this reflection is important. So I think uh, talking to people is 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 going to be key for the development of uh, a healthy impact of technologies on the construction systems and construction industries. Um, talking to people means talking to the present, talking to the past, looking into archives. Um, you'd be fascinated how much of the questions that we think are new today that have been handled by someone somewhere 50 years ago. Um, and so while tools can be fascinating by their efficiencies, I think we need to be grounded within our legacy of history, right? That, that, that the profession has developed, the humanity has developed, uh, that at least we should be aware of it. Um, and, and it's only by reinforcing the ties between those two things that we can arrive to a very, I think, important um, applications. And that's probably something that future generations can think about and develop. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good, it's a good, it's a good note. You, we just mentioned the uh, emerging new professions that probably um, uh, will come from from old from old professions. Um, and and you also mentioned that uh, sometimes the answers are uh, existing in in things we did 50 years ago. I sometimes uh, a phrase over the years have been phrasing that um, the solution probably is you can find those solutions to, to modern problems in um, in uh, in solutions that are uh, hundreds of years, if not millen uh, uh, thousands of years um, old. And I always like to go really back in time um, to see some of these solutions being applied to today. Uh, one of the examples that uh, have always been like a, a funny moment at my previous uh, uh, company uh, was when we would have to discuss a certain uh, uh, building corner design. And this was a very modular building and uh, typically kind of younger professionals struggles to find the right corner solution and then I would bring the example of a Greek uh, uh, solution for for uh, for the corner uh, joints uh, because I do feel that some as you said some of this some of these modern problems has always been architectural problems has always been part of the of of, of the master builder scratching his head and finding how how am I going to solve this so Problem solving is not necessarily a, a modern a modern issue, yeah. but uh, yeah. So you also said talk to people, and I think um, uh, as we as it's very popular here in in at least here in Denmark talking about uh, buildings for people and the human centric approach. So I do I do appreciate your 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 point. Communication is probably at the root of half, if not all conflicts in the world and I think um, the more we understand each other and the more I think we we uh, we share knowledge um, the better for for all of us um, regardless of where we're coming from um with some this is a uh, fascinating uh, conversation and uh, I would really like to I, I wish I would have been able to be there or that you would be able to be here um nonetheless uh, it was it was a ple a pleasure to uh, meet you. And I hope you have enjoyed uh, the conversation, even though there were yes. some difficult uh, questions. I don't know, difficult questions, <laughs> amazing. So, I mean, I, we're not here to just, you know, like talk about normal things. So I think uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, for, for the invitation again. And 
it was no it was completely it was really enjoyable and i really like and learned actually a lot through this conversation as well interesting thank you so much with have a nice day and thank, thank you everybody see you in the next episode thank you ciao bye 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 Thank you.